Iago. I think that's how it's pronounced. Iago? Iago? Iago, there we are. Iago just stuff. It's a Shakespeare thing, isn't it? The Aladdin cartoon is where I got it. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I thought of too. <laughs> We're both trash. We're just trash. People. <laughs> I know. Hello, this is the Quackcast, the Drunk Duck Quackcast. I'm Ozone Ocean, and with me is Baines, Tams, and Pitt. Hi, guys. Hello. 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 Yeah, hello, hello. This is Quackcast number 479, and we're going to be talking about the idea of exploring ideas in fiction. And the idea I'm sort of positing that fiction that enhances reality in some way or what is commonly known as genre fiction but really not not really just limited to that fiction where things are just taken and heightened somewhat is used better to bring interesting ideas across to the audience especially when you want a broad recognition of these interesting ideas rather than straight non-enhanced fiction where you're not really taking things too crazy I'm not saying you can't do that in straight fiction, but it's usually in so-called genre fiction, it's usually used a lot more for that, especially when you're bringing an interesting idea to a big audience, for various reasons, which we'll talk about. It's because, like, fantasy is so much easier to write, right? (laughs) Uh, Yeah, precisely. But before we get into that, I want to bring up the featured comic. A the featured was a feature that uh, I featured this week. It was a uh, Tang Cow English version of this. Uh, there's also a Spanish language version if you can read Spanish. I'll, I'm going to talk about Tang Cow now. Hello, I'm Ozone Ocean, and my feature for the week was Tang Cow. The English version. An ancient old woman shambles up to an even older tree that stands alone and isolated on a bare green hill. She makes a request of it, undergoes an intense magical ritual, and examines the detritus and trinkets she's collected over the course of her life. What is the purpose of all this? Hopefully, we will soon see. Life is going through a process of transition here. The art in Tang Kao is delicious, lush, and colourful. It's bright digital work. The story is fantasy. It's told mostly through images with only minimal text. And there's even a Spanish language version, if you would like to try that. If you speak Spanish and maybe you're more familiar with that language or more comfortable, you can... I have a choice of either one, so that's pretty good. Uh, Tankal is only just beginning, so now is the time when you can just jump in and start with it. It's uh, going through fairly frequent updates, I think, so there's you know quite a lot of storage just to keep following the flow. The art, yeah, I, it's really, really lovely. There's uh, very nice landscapes and also this great scene where the old woman does magic and there's these fantastic like glyphs in the air around the the woman that show her spell and it's uh, sort of rendered in this very abstract way with the colors kind of bubbling out it's really cool anyway most of the art in this comic is really impressive it's yeah really sort of very pro done i would say very polished work anyway i hope you enjoy it tang cow uh, this is a comic by marv and it's rated e for everyone and that was the featured comic which is tang cow the english version all right so after that we have the featured music gummels has given us the theme to fated feather which is a comic that's been on drunk duck for many 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 years now uh the creator Iogo Jester was one of our um, long-term members, and she's actually come back to the site, you know, in in the past months, and and uploading her comic again, Faded Feather, and it was featured many, many, many years ago, maybe ten years ago. So, wow, welcome back. Yeah, come aboard, me hearties. Cast off and sail away into the balmy tropical sunshine as warm waters lap the hull. The bow wave glitters in the sunshine. The rigging creaks in the warm breeze and sea foam 
floats by in our wake. Today is the time for adventure on the green seas. So take it away Gun Wallace with Iago Jester's Fated Feather. Fated Feather, Gun Wallace's uh, theme for Fated Feather. This is a comic by Baines. Pronounce it for me, please. Iago. Iago Jester. See, Baines says it right. It's uh, Iago. Lovely name. Uh, I believe it's based on the uh, the bird from Aladdin, <laughs> or or the main antagonist in Othello. <laughs> Who knows. <laughs> <laughs> and I did have to look that up on Wikipedia because I couldn't remember. Um, <laughs> oh, goodness me. All right. So, Baines, your main contention is that fantasy is easy to write. Are you going to defend that statement? <laughs> well, it's just like it's not real. So it's like magic and just like, you know, robots that can do anything. So it's like anybody can do it. Yeah, I often find that in fantasy. It's always robots that can do anything. Yeah. I mean, jeez. Just get more creative, guys, you know? Just write real-world stuff, not your robots that can do anything. Just mm-hmm. lazy bastards. No, no, no. Let's, um... That's not really the point. I, I love fantasy and I love sci-fi, and they're not easy to write at all. Um, they're all quite... Cha- they all have their challenges. All kinds of writing has its challenges. Nothing's easy. We just uh, approach things in different ways, and... There's stuff for different audiences. Or, you know, you want to tell different styles, types of story. But my the, my contention here is that if you're wanting to explore bigger ideas about social issues or um, uh, life and death, mainly it's often it's usually social issues or politics, things like that. Stories with a heightened reality usually are a very good way to do this if you want to get that idea across to a bigger audience or you know if you want to package an idea for mass consumption it's often a better approach to do that in a story with heightened elements now we this is characterized as genre fiction by um many people but i characterize it as say a story with heightened elements so you take the reality a lot further you know you might you might uh, caricature things you might cartoonize or you might just have elements of fantasy or science fiction in order to exaggerate the point and that is uh, usually done more successfully in that kind of a story than it is with something that doesn't take stuff into those kind of realms it doesn't exaggerate anything and it doesn't go outside the bounds of normal ordinary everyday 
reality. Um, there's many, many examples of this, of course, and like, you know, Fahrenheit 541 is a fantastic example of the idea of uh, people who destroy culture in order to, um, and in order to hide the past. So the idea of that book was all culture had to be through uh, TV screens. And you couldn't really, you couldn't have any memory of the past because they would destroy all the books. So that was like, and it was set in the future because of that, because we had to have big TVs. So the, the heightened idea of that was, of course, that all books are destroyed and the only way we could remember that kind of, uh, we could remember the past was by getting individuals to remember individual books. So people would become the books. And there was a whole commune of people that would just, you know, transfer entire books to each other because nothing could be written down. Um, another right, another one, famous one, say um, Animal Farm, where we have an allegory of, uh, like, like a um, a controlled economy or a controlled society. People often say it's like communist, but not not necessarily communist, but a con absolutely controlled society you're having a, a failed revolution starting again and it's how it's a story about how it goes bad because it's taken control of by the charismatic dictators which are the pigs and you know all people are equal but some are more equal than others so whereas you could talk, tell a story about where that had really happened say you know just a very straightforward retelling of i don't know communism in you know with stalinism what what stalin had done but really would it have the would it have had the the most the as broader kind of um spread and recognition by people well we know that it didn't because many people have written about what stalin had did and you know his approach to uh, communism and you know people have written like volumes and volumes about all sorts of dictators who have done the same thing but none of them have had the same impact as animal farm so that was a very good way of conceptualizing that concept lord of the flies another you know kind of story about that kind of thing and it, it's heightened you know so we we heighten that that kind of you know the the scenario and we take it a bit further so anyway that's my contention um uh bane's i like weighed in on this when i was like uh, putting the idea to tance and pit and i wasn't very good at conceiving the idea originally but uh bane sort of crystallized it in terms of like a twilight zone and the way um that is handled it was able to put a lot of very clever and interesting social and political ideas to people for broad consumption and get it across without people often realizing that's what it was doing and it's noted and it's sort of known today for doing that you know it's ideas of like uh, the way it's approached racism and and uh, people being ugly and you know all sorts of different yeah. <laughs> different things and yeah, it's yeah. There was some uh, disagreement on the idea initially, but it, it sort of like is morphed into this kind of thing, I guess. Right? Is that fair to say? Um, you want me to sum up exactly how it went? Do we? Because matter, whatever you guys uh, want. What what Oz has uh, described right now is completely different from where we started off, and what he is saying is definitely very much. A thing that is uh, true and correct. Um, what we started off, and my problem with the initial thing was that the concept that he uh, he put forward was that um, heightened fiction or but easier in order to explore things like death and uh, 
bigger concepts and existentialism and stuff like that. And I was opposed to that. But that now is not the topic. It has shifted into talking about uh, creating allegories and that certain uh, types of fiction lend themselves better to creating an allegory. And that is definitely something that is true. Right. So okay. you're saying, so I think you're just trying to say that there has been a whole log morphing conversation before this that our listeners won't hear. Well, there's quite a lot of back and forth, um, and not bad back and forth, but um, that it, it, it's taken a lot to kind of come to where we are now. Is that just kind of basically what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, uh, that this is actually what I was trying to say, but I was like saying it really badly um in in terms of you know the the death and all that kind of thing but this is actually what i i am i was trying to get at that i mean the yeah. the discussion and the quote-unquote disagreement was would have been a worthy quack cast actually it was good fruitful conversation <laughs> so we're talking about the quack cast that never was now the quack cast that never was yeah it was actually really good i thought you know like really uh... yeah because because we started off from a completely different thing which is fine this is exactly what a fruit uh, a fruitful debate should be uh, in uh, in terms of uh, yielding a particular result because it's a completely different thing uh, on what you want as a creator to do like the impact you want to have on an audience and it's a completely different thing on whether it is easier to double, quote unquote, in certain genres as opposed to others, which is something that I'm directly opposed to that there is no genre that is easier than the other, oh. if you want to do it right. Um, well, unfortunately, that's unfortunately, never what I was saying. But... The hoops that you need to jump through are maybe look different, but they are the same in the sense that you need to still do the basic stuff that you are required in order to create and uh, build the proper story. So that's that that was a completely different uh, discussion though because now we are talking about creating proper allegories from uh, our reality and the real world into the heightened realities of uh, different genres, which is a fascinating topic and absolutely uh, valid and legit that yeah, you can get across ideas if you sort of abstract them from from uh, our reality into a different setting and uh, you say what you want to say within that setting using the analogy that is proper and correct if you have the skill and you are accomplished enough to do it so absolutely well let's let's bring up something from our discussion which is okay we mentioned um bright as so there's two different approaches to to racism in heightened fiction that we to brought up so there's the the black and white people from the star trek original series where we have to people who have black on one side and white on the other and the other people have black on the other side and white on the other and that was like a very broad kind of uh characterism char like exploration of racism because these two people they these two peoples they were racist against each other because they were you know black on and white on opposite sides and but you know the, the whole point of that was to show oh you know they're actually the same kind of peoples and the difference is just such a minor superficial thing and it's showing like how racism is so superficial um say so bright looks at racism in a different way you know we've got the racism against the orcs because of you know what their people have you know their alliance with the dark one originally and the elves are, were meant to be the good guys but the elves are sort of like these white supremacists but the way like even though bright is heightened fiction it handles this incredibly poorly because the racism isn't depicted in a clever way the racism is just swapping elves for white people and 
you know, uh, like wasps, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, and it's putting the orcs in the role of black people with exactly the same culture. So the orcs are sort of hanging around and um, like poor, poor black people in America and the elves live in the, the, you know, the good suburbs and that kind of stuff. And that's like incredibly badly portrayed because you're not handling that in a, in a clever or interesting way. You're just swapping people out. Which is stupid. Or like Avatar was another a, a example of doing like in a story about ecology and, you know, uh, dispossession of native peoples from the native lands really badly because you they didn't portray it in a clever or interesting way. They just put Native Americans... They just gave Native Americans blue skin and put them on an alien planet. They didn't actually characterize it in a clever way, say the way um, is that's done in. Uh, um, isn't there a there's a cartoon Australian one about um, uh, this forest being destroyed? Do you guys know it? Fern Gully. Fern Gully, yeah. So Fern Gully does the same thing. You know, it's a story about it's an allegory about. Um, you know ecology and destroying the environment but it's done in in a way that actually characterizes it in a more interesting clever way it doesn't just put like doesn't just copy native americans and give them blue skin and turn them into cat aliens you know so there's different ways of doing this can i can i just um say something on on this issue because i don't think that uh, thinly veiling and thinly dressing up something as something else in order to uh, sort of, of quote-unquote photograph what you're going to say is a problem in and of itself. Um, you can thinly veil uh, black people as a particular social group or race in your fantasy or whatever and uh, make your statement about their situation in real life. The problem that Bright had wasn't that, in my opinion. The problem was that it ended up, it, it, it did such a bad job of the analogy that it runs the risk of actually justifying the racism that exists in real life. Why? Because uh, an analogy is like a, like a seesaw. It, it works both ways. When uh, you communicate an analogy, people are going to naturally apply, try at least to apply it to real life when they realize that you are creating an analogy. So what they are doing was they had uh, the orcs as uh, being uh, black people and having uh, black culture and so on. But whereas in real life, the racism against black people and their culture is unfounded and unfair and wrong. In the bright universe, it had some uh, grain of truth, at least uh, like, uh, I don't know how many millennia back. But in any case, it, it, uh, it stemmed from a very real, objective, negative and evil situation. Black people in reality haven't ever, uh, you know, made the fact with the freaking <laughs> devil or anything mm. like that. So there is no reason, even if you go that far back, to justify any sort of discrimination or negative approach towards them in reality. Whereas in, in Bright, you could understand that people could uh, uh, um, justifiably be afraid that they are potential. Uh, agents of evil or whatever. So that said, that that is the big problem that might arise if you do an allegory wrong. If you don't get the analogy correctly, then people are going to run the risk of, of taking the error that you have created or you have made in your heightened reality and apply it to, to our actual reality. So they might feel actually justified in being racist towards black people or any other race uh, to speak of. So that's the 
bigger issue here. That is, uh, that, that's where the difficulty lies because you can very much, uh, you can very easily go uh, and make superficial matches between uh, reality and your heightened fantasy. But if you don't have a very, very good grasp on the social issue that you want to convert into yeah. your fantasy land, then you will end up making errors that are potentially very um, uh, troubling. They add to the problem rather than uh, address the problem. Yeah, well, yeah, um, that said, Bright would have approached that better if it had taken either one of two different approaches, like instead of like making the orcs just copy everything that black people do, when you still actually have black people in your world, have the orcs being orcs, so they're very different. But you can still have the idea of racism because of, you know, mm -hmm. people's attitudes towards them, but they're still orcs and they're not just copying black people. So then you're, you know, you're height, heightening things. Or... yeah. Um, they could have still done them as black people, but had the the hatred against them be unjustified. So it wasn't that they made a pact with the the devil or made a pact with the you know the dark one. It was the fact that the elves just hate them because they got green skin and they don't like <laughs> these brutish people. They think they're they are uncouth and they they don't like you know the way they. They, their, their language and that kind of stuff or they think they're naturally superior so if it had used either one of those two approaches then it would have been a bit bit more clever yeah it would have been more uh, interesting definitely if you had instead of different races that's another issue that I personally generally have with fantasy but that's a different story if you have instead of races and you have uh fundamentally, actually, legitimately different races. Uh, you have just uh, the same race with uh, slightly different phenotypes, and that's where the racism is happening. Uh, whereas the, like, they are actually uh, same, the same genus and the same, I don't know how is to call it, like the same uh, species. But uh, they discriminate between themselves for very superficial skin deep reasons that have nothing to do with their history yeah. in the sense that uh, when I say nothing to do with their history I don't mean socioeconomically I mean in terms of ethics or in terms of you know one race uh, broke the world and the other race fixed it or something like that <laughs> um, uh, something that could be like a an anathema that blights the entire race for some reason. If you know what yeah, I mean. like the the black white white black people where the differences are. Yeah, exactly. For sure. That's why that was actually a clever analogy. Whereas bright was not because uh, for whatever reason the the creators didn't seek to uh, make better matches between. Our reality in the other one, um, and that's the other, the other thing that I will say and stop there. Zootopia, which was much better accepted, <laughs> again the same issue oh, because really? you have predators versus herbivores mm -hmm. in that particular setting. And actually, I liked Zootopia a lot, uh, but it has the same issue in the terms of the analogy. Uh, predators that are being discriminated against by the now socially dominant herbivores actually presented a very viable and valid uh, threat and danger to the herbivores because they freely eat them yeah. and they still yeah. have dietary needs I suppose which is something that's not very directly addressed um, so that that is a legit concern that the herbivore would have against the predator, a, a carnivore uh, so, again, you have racism depicted as having roots in something practically real that, that has happened in the past, and that's why uh, the, the racism 
exists. Yes. Yeah, so as Pitt said in her comment, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, you know, if you you're failing to use your fantasy as your heightened reality correctly, mm -hmm. which um, completely undermines what you're trying to do. So why bother using heightened reality or fantasy if you're just going to mess it up like that? So that's a good thing to be aware of. Mm -hmm. Like, what is what is the point? <laughs> what is the point if you do it wrong like that? Um, so I want to also put forward that you don't need necessarily like heightened reality is something um, um, relative in the sense that you can create the, the the imagery or the impression of heightened reality even within the constraints of uh, quote unquote realism. Like you have you don't have magic, for example, you don't have spaceships and stuff, and you don't have the dystopian future uh, or some other. Uh, stories and you still can create this situation and you still can create the allegory and I'm thinking of uh, uh, Wells uh, Wells story short story the country of the blind if you have read it it's about uh, I don't think it has ever been made into movies or plays but I might be wrong anyway it is this uh, story about this explorer who stumbles like literally falls through a caldera and and uh, discovers this cut of civilization of people that are uh, all blind every single one of them is blind oh, yeah. and uh, he is the only sighted person in this particular society so he can see certain things and he can understand certain things that they have no real concept of and he is, he is regarded very quickly as being the problem in their society and they uh, demand that he blind himself in order to remain there. Now, I'm, I'm not going to, to spoil anything else because uh, all the motives and all the analogies are very specific. Uh, they are a very specific commentary about our society as the country of the blind. Um, the, the point I wanted to make by bring, bringing it up is that there is nothing supernatural about this situation uh, because in the end I think I think we discovered that they generally make sure that everyone is blind they are not just all born blind uh, so there is no science fiction let's say in the whole thing the only fantastical element which is not all that fantastical, is that this is a civilization that is cut off from the mainstream uh, Western or, you know, the rest of the world from which the explorer comes from. So you can still create the, your allegory and your heightened reality within any, any genre. Well, it just might take more, perhaps, ingenuity, maybe. I, but it can still be done. I, I would say that that is it is heightened because it's creating an unusual scenario that is that yeah, doesn't so exist. Since, mm -hmm. I mean, because that that is had to be invented. You know, it's like that would be very unlikely for that to that to exist. So that means you're sort of you're working to create a world, whereas stuff that is more set in the real world doesn't have to go to those kind of lengths and people will still try and tell the same kind of you know have the same kind of big ideas explored but it's um it's not as straightforward a process well i don't know not it been it, it is a can be a very straightforward process but it's not going to be like um, consumed as readily or as e easily by people, mm -hmm. or you know, it's you're not going to get that idea across to such a broad audience. Yeah, that's a different. Again, that is a different uh, discussion. Like your purpose and how much you want, like who do you want to reach, and 
depending on who you want to reach, you create uh, your heightened reality. That's basically what fairy tales are in a good uh, percentage. Uh, morsels of experience and, and uh, admonition wrapped up into a story that is digestible to kids. That's a fairy tale. So there's also that. Well, let's say, let's say take um, something that is more set, you know, that is not as heightened um, and a take on racism. Say Mark Twain's uh, Huckleberry Finn and mm. that sort of takes, it gives, you know, a very good look at racism and, and how things were in America at the time when, you know, that, that story is set. And that is not a, a very heightened kind of story. That I would say that was very much set in, you know, a very real world kind of setting. And that actually is quite successful, I think, that mm -hmm. uh, that does do the idea very successful, successfully without using an allegory to do it. And I would say that's more successful than say, well, I don't know if it's more successful, but say, um, uh, uh, is Swift, was he the one who wrote Gulliver's Travels? I think so, yeah. So he's he's got the story, you know, Gulliver's Travels. Gulliver goes to the, the land of the horse, you know, these horse people where, um, you know, horses are in charge of people, I think. Baines, you've read it, haven't you? Oh, Baines has, has plumped off here. Yeah, I have read it. I have read it. Yeah, you've read uh, it. So that, that's an allegory yeah. of, of racism there because or an allegory of slavery, not racism, because the horses um, in that world are, you know, very intelligent, very thinking kind of people. And, you know, he's sort of thinking that, oh, God, I would never, like, in, in my world, horses like a beast of burden and they're sort of treated like, you know, like disposable kind of, kind of creatures. And here, these horses are incredibly intelligent, you know, thinking, um, feeling people. So he's sort of getting people to think about, I don't know, a a aspects of animal rights, but you can also think about it in terms of uh, slavery too. So which do you think is, is more successful at, at sort of expressing those ideas, his heightened story or um, Huckleberry Finn? I wouldn't compare them, to be honest. And the reason I wouldn't compare them is that it could be very easily argued that you, as an audience, see what you choose to see in the particular work. Because, for example, uh, is, uh, as, as is in the book, not uh, because uh, often in the movies they change certain things to create a different drama than uh, there was in the book. Uh, it is more of a study of uh, childhood, the, in my opinion, than a study of racism per se. The, the, the element there is that it is a very, very accurate photograph of that particular point in time and place. And that's what creates the commentary now, because we compare that world which has passed, it is in the past, as it was at least, to our world and, and the uh, sensibilities, if you want to call them that, that we are entertaining now. Again, that is just my opinion, the way that I have read the books. And in Gulliver's Travels, you get this character, this character, and how he is affected by each civilization that he visits. He visits three. One is the giants, then, or or the other way. And I think the first one are the Lilliputians, and then you have the giants, and then you have the horse people. These are the three uh, different mm -hmm. ones. Um, and in each one, the character acquires character traits that you can see he immediately adapts from being in the ruling class, quote unquote of every single one of these, of these uh, different civilizations, including the horse people, who take them, take him into their society and into their st uh, social class, if you like, 
because unlike the other people that they use as beasts of burden and as lesser uh, creatures, he is also civilized as these horses are. And so they, they, find, they find him as a peculiarity and a curiosity and take, take him in. And so he gets to meet their civilization and he likes it. And he comes to despise the yeah, Yahoo, yeah, some yeah, the the Yahoo's. yes, uh, in, uh, uh, very much like the horses do. So, in my opinion, what what uh, the commentary is not on on racism or slavery. It is really that uh, you become what your friends or those you socialize with are. In the sense that he slowly becomes part of the class in which he is, rather than actually change the social class in which he finds himself in, if you know what I mean. But again, mm. this is what I choose to see. Mm. You, for example, you chose to see the whole uh, commentary on slavery, which I didn't see, not uh, in that level. Um, and that is another beauty when it comes to heightened realities and uh, uh, allegories, or maybe just uh, an experiment in a different society or something like that. Uh, you may not, unless it is very specific what the author is trying to say, like for example, Animal Farm or uh, Brave New World and uh, stories like this, or, uh, or uh, Rhinoceros by Ionesco, the play, uh, then you also have a part in, as an audience, in what you choose to see in the work. If it's not very specific, the, the author doesn't actually guide you to see the very specific issue he or she wants to explore. So, yeah, I, I like. Um, I mean, that's. I have. I'm a strong believer. I guess. Well, I hope that's not me. That buzzing. No. Sorry. Um, is not ha not being too like didactic with your theme and you know when you when people write something having a point is great and having something that you're passionate about as the underlying theme that's great but I mean if you're too you know and malicious with it you're trying to be too forceful you're trying to sort of corral anyone who reads or watches what you do into your way of thinking that's usually a fail um, other than I mean other than an exceptional I can talk about I guess but uh, if, if it, you have a powerful theme but it's hidden enough that everyone can take something like some strong message or some strong point out of it that might be different depending on who those people are and different as the years go on then that's great that's a success mm. you know, it's, I mean it's kind of crazy in a way like you know like the point is the real point is lost um but if it's a good story and the point is like kind of flexible in a way or it's got like wisdom to offer or power to offer that takes a different shape in different people's minds like i think that's great well yes say the, want... the lord of the rings has been taken in a lot of different ways so tolkien himself said oh no there's no allegory there's nothing here it's just you know the story about this little plucky innocent hobbits traveling across middle earth you know to drop off the ring and you know it's sort of like has its roots in i don't know the nibelung and all sorts of um you know wagnerian kind of stuff and and also um you know uh, norse mythology but we can from reading it we can see yeah this guy did live during and fight during the first world war he experienced that stuff and he lived during the second world war and even if these things didn't weren't explicit in the writing you can you can definitely see the the reality that influenced his writing and because of that they are very evocative of those things and you can get messages about them from the writing you know the in the mass industrialization of small villages that's right there in the story because he experienced that that was the world in which he lived and that does have have meaning about that even if it wasn't deliberate it's still very much there um 
and it's and because it's in a, a fantasy context it does strike you a lot more you know the scouring of, of the village and how it, it gets industrialized by Suriman and the the beautiful little you know bucolic country town that it is gets turned into this uh, you know polluted wasteland by by Suriman and his um his flunkies and that that is a very striking image i think a, a lot of people take that away you know let alone the the horror of a massive war where where all these people are involved you know that also can be very striking because you know you you can relate that to oh my god war is not really such a romantic thing it's a desolating thing it leaves everything you know a lot lot of people are killed by this this is such a, a horrible thing to happen so in even when ideas like you were saying Baines even when they're not intentional they can you know if it's powerfully enough written it can you can still take that away and because it is you know that that heightened simplified kind of world that's a lot more striking than say if you read about you know some village that was industrialized in the 19th century and turned into a a polluted wasteland that might not be as a a striking image as this one was in Lord of the Rings you you, uh, have to read the Zorlad and and Zerminal and and things like that (laughs) Uh, what I'm saying is that um, again a lot of it a lot of it hinges on the penmanship let's say and uh, the the power of the word uh, put on the page uh, by the creator. Because, for example, I'll, I'll, I want to give an example on that. Um, uh, there is now, uh, for some reason, I had it before, and now I completely forgot the author, and it's uh, it's terrible on my part. But uh, the book or the play, if you like, uh, called The Enemy of the People. And I'll find out who extremely genius, famous author created it. Uh, um, anyway, uh, is an extremely heightened reality in an extremely realistic setting. And it is amazing because the entire story is about this very passionate Basil style. Uh, main character who um, just realizes that there is uh, that camp that is a, a part of this village that he I think he grew in he grew up in or whatever and he returns educated uh, being uh, I think a prosecutor or uh, whatever and uh, he realizes that there is this uh, power plant or some kind of industrialization that is taking place and it is absolutely poisoning and ruining the the health of the people and and uh, they are eventually going to suffer big consequences but because uh, there are a lot of uh, high interests in uh, keeping the plant there he is very quickly uh, from uh, he becomes very quickly from the popular young hero of the village to the uh, enemy of the village that he wants to destroy it, whereas he is the only one that he actually cares to preserve it. And the way that these things uh, happen, the, the the series of events and the domino effect that happens is is ghastly towards. Um, I don't think I have ever seen it in any kind of allegory and it stuck with me ever since I actually read it and I have to give credit where it's due, it has been uh, converted into film extremely well, if you ever see it uh, even in uh, in uh, Greek uh, cinema uh, that was a, a very powerful movie, okay. now I'm going to Google The Enemy of the People 
people and find out who wrote it and feel very embarrassed. <laughs> um, okay. So, let's see. Like, I have a... Ibsen, yes, thank you. <laughs> oh, my Ibsen, goodness. really? Ibsen has been awesome. So, yeah, yes. definitely read it. It's not a fun story in the sense uh, that Ibsen wasn't a fun uh, writer. It's not fluffy. Okay, it's not fluffy. Ibsen never wrote fluff, but uh, I love pretty much everything he wrote because it remains very realistic, and it's like you are sunk with a shard of glass and the wound never heals. That's how powerful he is and how impactful. And of course, very popular as well for that purpose exactly, so. Ibsen, the two plays I've seen by Ibsen were Hedda Gabler and mm -hmm. A Doll's House. Of course. <laughs> which were, you know, obviously the, these things were very well known because it's about, you know, the plight of women in the 19th century. But I think perhaps the reason why, a, a big reason why they're really well known is because that was a subject that really wasn't being addressed. And mm -hmm. this was a man who became very famous about it. And because, you know, you had to be a man in order to get the traction back then doing stories about these subjects and no one else was doing it so I don't know whether that was a, really a case of good writing and oh come I mean, on it, now no no, no, no. no it wrote perfectly well he I, I'm not saying it is bad writing the fact, that he was a, the fact that he was a man has nothing to do with the quality of his writing and the success of his writing well I'm uh, I'm trying to say that there are other factors that 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 also contributed to it being as memorable and as well known. No, 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 no. Again, I agree there on just this. wasn't anybody uh, else doing that. That's not really accurate either. Uh, there are a lot of people that, the women as well, that have written certain things that became very popular, even if they had to pose as, as men. Uh, however, the reason Ibsen became so, uh, let's say, popular wasn't because he was the one that discovered the will and uh, wrote about women's issues. He didn't write only about women's issues. He wrote about people issues, and that's the most important thing. He didn't separate the plight of of uh, human existence into men, women, children, parents, or whatever. For example, if you read the Ghosts, which is my favorite, uh, and I really recommend it if you are in the mood for something like that, because again, he pulls no punches in the way that he writes. Uh, I have seen he, ghosts the play as well. Yes. What? I've I've seen the ghosts performed mm -hmm. as a play. Yes. Um, he he became he he was very incisive in the sense that he chose to address issues that were not being usually addressed, not in terms of gender only, in terms of the human existence. I really don't like him being presented as having hit like a, a swing that uh, made him more commercial without like he the man is extremely talented and that's why he was successful there were many other men writing plays in that particular timeline and trying to be very sophisticated and powerful and then you get this level of success. So it's not, I don't I don't uh, want people that contributed this much to, to the art of dialogue uh, being uh, 
diminished into being uh, okay yeah yeah he was a man and he and uh, people uh, had the spotlight on him and that's why he he was successful I don't think that's fair like that at all so and I'm a woman okay so. <laughs> <laughs> yes he was a very good writer Ghosts was a very powerful play very um a great play I recommend it to anyone to see it if they have a performance near them um Oh, damn it. I was thinking of another aspect of this stuff and it's gone out of my bubble headed head. Um, oh, well, we're getting a bit over time here, but uh, this has been a very interesting discussion on many you aspects. Mm-hmm. I'll go on, Pip. Do you think you can sum up your. <laughs> to sound like a third grade teacher, but this is really quite deep diving in a sense can you Mm. sum up what your thoughts would be about the subject my thoughts you were just talking about (laughs) both of you everybody the cat everybody not me though i don't have thoughts (laughs) my my thoughts are that uh giving yourself oh i remember what i was going to say just before i do that Okay, so a very powerful story about the horrors of World War II that I read a while ago was The Skin by Curzio Malaparte, an Italian writer, Italian man who, uh, you know, experienced this, you know, as as many millions of people did experience the horrors of uh, the Second World War. But uh, in the story, he's he's provided a, a realistic account of the events that happened to him, but also a heightened account as well, which serves to like get across the bizarreness and the unusualness of the events of the Second World War that people were forced to endure. You know, too often we have a very realistic take, and we just don't realize that this is an incredibly unusual bizarre thing to happen to humanity and we're just thinking in terms of oh yeah um the italians were here the greeks were here there you know this bad thing happened and this bad thing happened we're just sort of thinking it from a very kind of yeah like a a very prosaic thing or we might be thinking of in terms of tragedy or you know people starving and all this kind of thing and sure that is a very real aspect of what happened during the second world but this writer also characterized things well just related things in a certain way that conveyed to you the bizarreness of what happened you know the way society was absolutely ripped apart and transformed the way normal life was transformed into something horrific and strange which i thought was really kind of valuable take on you know the i on the events of the second world war because it wasn't just about it's like today if someone were to write about the the covid19 and just sort of said yep there was no toilet paper yep um yeah people refused to wear masks yep and that would convey to you like yeah like a very prosaic normal kind of by dots what happened but in order to really convey the ridiculousness of this situation and the bizarreness of going out at eight o'clock at night and seeing the streets dead and the only people like at six o'clock at night and the only people the only movement being uh uber eats people that's what it was like here in perth like on bicycles like suddenly they have those people in front of cafes and writing and how everything is just dead and bare and it's only that that's the only movement the only life on the streets everything else is closed and how eerie it is you know like and and the bizarreness of these these people protesting against wearing masks and protesting against being protected from this virus that can be so deadly to their friends and family like they're showing their rights to infect people like if if you could like you you have to be able to to use the tools of your fiction in order to convey how ridiculous and horrific people's responses to this stuff anyway go on and zombie 
movies and stuff like that were very good. I mean, at doing that sort of thing, at least up until a point to where it got too uh, kind of connect the dots or paid by the numbers ish. Um, Night of the Living Dead originally was an allegory for um, uh, what was it? I think it was not for the civil rights movement, but for racism, I think. Uh, something like that. Um, I don't want to say it was an allegory for the civil rights movement because it wasn't negatively depicting the civil rights movement. It was related to that whole time period and the paranoia and stuff that people were feeling and all that kind of thing. And maybe it's an allegory that was in a little too high relief or maybe it's just removed because you watch Night of the Living Dead and you don't think about... Um, uh, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But that was what was behind that whole movie. Um, so maybe in that instance, at least now, which isn't fair because we're, remo we're removed from it, but at least now uh, the allegory gets lost a little bit because of how high relief it is. Um mm -hmm what it's doing but it, it the I can't remember words I hate it when I do this um, <laughs> the, 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 the. well anyway how well it can work though is a testament to um, as as you were describing how COVID affects us right now and the feeling that 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 is pervasive as you do you know walk outside at night or just that weird feeling um it does do well with allegory because I, it just does but mm -hmm. uh, I'm off the track I hate it when I do this but um fuck it just go because <laughs> it's an unusual it's such an unusual, such a bizarre oh, I, situation. I think actually that uh, you made a very, very good point that sometimes the relief might become so high that the allegory is lost because it becomes something completely disjointed or different yeah. or its own thing. Not necessarily a bad situation, okay? I'm not saying that this is a bad thing. But uh, yeah, sometimes the allegory is so successful and so high in relief that people take uh, run with it and they take it to completely different places and so on and so forth. So it's really, uh, again, it comes down, so and this is me summing up my own thoughts, uh, it comes down to what the author wants to do and how skilled, at least. Let's not say talented. I, I would say skilled they are into actually um, converting what they want, what they have in their minds and hearts into actual uh, storytelling, whatever that storytelling is. So you have different genres and you have different uh, tools of the trade in with which to do this. Um, and in the end, the, the thing that you have to keep in mind is that there are no shortcuts into creating this particular uh, uh, allegory and when you want to make a statement, especially about society, uh, whether you choose to make it straight up, like uh, this is uh, the society and this is the statement I want to make, or whether you want to take it to an allegorical place so that you will avoid the whole political shenanigan thing that might uh, completely miss the point, Again, you need to be very specific and focused and have the skills to do it. Because to make this heightened reality experience so that your point comes across and people discuss your point and not something perhaps different or it just passes unnoticed, you have to know what it is you are doing. There is no easy genre in which to do this. That's my my two cents on this whole thing. All right, thanks. Yeah, you're up. Wonderful, love it. Yeah, <laughs> good stuff. <laughs> I'm with you guys. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess for me, like a lot of it sort of probably depends on what what are the ideas that someone's trying to get across? What What is the allegory? Um, I, I definitely can see how it's way less confrontational, potentially, to do it in fantasy, horror, sci-fi, or other heightened, you know, some kind of heightened thing. Um, it's also probably more cinematic. Like, I know I've had my mind, I had my mind blown by uh, short stories most of them were not fantastical but uh you know sort of like stories with an unreliable narrator or sort of uh, i remember a story i think a short story uh i think it was called fat about a waitress who like recognizes the prejudice that her co-workers and everyone are, are holding towards someone and she sort of has a mental turn and she like manages to outgrow it like I, I like stuff like that. The Twilight Zone is a lot of it is in that territory of kind of, you know, very, it's very humanist. It's very kind of just bettering yourself as a human, mm. you know, trying to be better and trying to think outside the box and be kind of true to yourself. Like a lot of the Twilight Zone themes are along those lines, and it's a, like about perception in general. Um, that's what I get out of Gulliver's Travels too. I love I love Gulliver's Travels. Um, Okay. Even in a heightened genre, though, it can be abused. If you're, if the ideas are bad, if they're wrong, if they're ham-fistedly delivered, it's just as annoying as it would be to be, you know, have a didactic political point made straight up, you know. And that can even be is even being done sometimes in sci-fi and fantasy these days. And it, it, I know it does piss people off because I look at YouTube. Sure. <laughs> but uh. It's great stuff, like to have a theme. I, and I also think it's not easier, once again, nobody's saying it re that really now, but, or ever, like, the, it's easier to do certain genres. But I, I do think, like, horror, maybe, in particular, maybe sci-fi also, is kind of almost, like, alleg allegorical by its nature. Like, definitely horror. Like, it just that it exists, like, like you're talking about monsters and ghosts and zombies, it's like... It's almost like you, even if nobody meant to put an allegory in there, it can be found there. That's kind of cool to me. Mm -hmm. um, and it can mean so many different things, so many different people. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and those things in their nature, especially horror, the Baines and I both love horror, um, that in its nature becomes something more fantastical like even if you're not dealing with something like oh satan came out and he's walking down the street and now he's grabbing my neighbors and he's eating my cat and like um even if it's not as ridiculous as that in order to keep the horror things have to be prolonged <laughs> the situation has to be prolonged and you're almost forcing people to stay in this sort of situation where there is a threat and that almost always requires some um, unbelievable thing to happen or to take place. And oftentimes that can be used to make even more horror and more suspense. Um, so I think it's more difficult perhaps to find something distinctly, distinctively horror that doesn't go into that high, that higher relief of um, allegory, not necessarily allegory, but like disbelievability. And this is, we're not in real life anymore. We're not in real times anymore. Um, not to say that it doesn't happen. I am strictly in the middle of the road here. Um, I guess not, because I think I kind of agree more that it, it goes down to the instruments used and how it's uh it's executed um but maybe some things there are some genres that do lend themselves a little more easily to um the thing that we're talking about right now on this podcast to Fox. It's it's big big ideas God double meetings allegories right off of I can't yeah. take this big ideas and stuff <laughs> like that yeah it's... we were talking about earlier today my brain is fizzled out it's not that my fault it's your talking in abstracts is 
it's its own problem because you become too abstracted from what you're talking about. So that's that's a danger of it. I'm, I'm just far too much of a genius, stable genius, to be followed by the likes of you people. You are a very stable genius, as are we all. Okay, all right. Well, we'll we we'll wrap this up then thank you guys for talking about big ideas that's what i'll call this big ideas and fiction <laughs> excellent way better than my first title of genre fiction which is way too narrow big ideas in fiction okay thanks guys this has been a good topic and that's exactly what i wanted to do like um you know come to some kind of middle ground on this and like explore the idea so that's good all right talk to you next week guys and uh, listen to us next week please 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 home <laughs> no you're not allowed okay bye-bye people bye-bye, bye-bye.